In December 1921, a 14-year-old boy named Leonard Thompson was brought to Toronto General Hospital in Canada. He was slowly dying. He was very thin, skin and bones, weak, smelled like acetone and had high glucose levels running through his veins. He was diagnosed two years previously with a lethal form of diabetes, which we now call type 1 diabetes, a disease in which the hormone insulin is no longer produced by the body. Death could be somewhat postponed by a starvation diet. Was Leonard aware that he did not have long to live? Certainly his parents knew. They had seen him deteriorate over time. Leonard Thompson was in fact on death row the executioner being a lack of insulin. Why is insulin so important? Well, insulin controls uptake of glucose by the cells of your body, thereby providing cells with energy and lowering the glucose levels in your blood. Even if you eat several chocolate bars within a couple of minutes, glucose levels will hardly rise due to the action of insulin. Insulin also ensures that muscle and healthy fat tissue in your body are not broken down. So what happened in Leonard's body that made him so ill? Insulin is produced in approximately 1 million clusters of cells that are called islets of Langerhans, scattered like an archipelago in the pancreas. It is amazing that these islets, with the size of a grain of sand, together covering less than a tip of a teaspoon, are responsible for keeping your glucose levels so stable. The insulin producing cells measure the glucose in your blood continuously and provide exactly the right amount of insulin that your body needs. But in type 1 diabetes, these cells in the islet archipelago are destroyed by a hurricane of cells from one's own immune system, and there is no reconstruction possible. Imagine how Leonard's parents were desperately waiting for a medical breakthrough in 1921. And imagine how they must have felt when Leonard was chosen to receive a promising new treatment. The treatment was a purified extract of the pancreas of an ox containing a protein that was later called insulin. Toronto scientists had tested the extract on dogs with diabetes and found it was able to lower glucose levels and keep the dogs alive. Now it was time to test this treatment on a human. Leonard Thompson was the first patient. On the 11th of January 1922, Leonard was injected with the extract under supervision of his Toronto doctor, Walter Campbell. Several injections followed during that month. The extract worked. It lowered Leonard's glucose levels. Imagine this doctor. He started life-saving injections in a young boy with type 1 diabetes. What were his thoughts that for the first time he was able to offer a solution? Was he aware that this would be a historic moment? The discovery of insulin and the treatment of Leonard Thompson and other people with type 1 diabetes that would soon follow was hailed on the front pages of newspapers. Toronto doctors on track of diabetes cure. But was it a cure? What will people with Taiwan diabetes say now that more than 100 years of insulin treatment have passed? They will say that having Taiwan diabetes is hard work. That insulin must still be administered several times a day, every day, for the rest of their lives. They will say that glucose values need to be measured by finger pricks or glucose sensors every day for the rest of their lives. They will say that almost all relevant daily activities have an effect on glucose levels, so they need to continuously think about glucose control and the right amount of insulin. They will say they can never take a break from their diabetes, that there is this continuous threat that glucose levels become too low due to excess insulin, leading to loss of consciousness, that there is an increased risk of complications with damage to eyes, kidneys and nerves because with insulin treatment glucose levels are still not optimal. People with type 1 diabetes will say that sometimes these potential consequences paint a bleak picture of their lives in the back of their mind. And they will say 
that one does not have diabetes alone. Also parents, partners, loved ones feel the impact of the disease and experience the disease burden. Insulin treatment is no cure. Doctors, together with diabetes specialist nurses, nutritionists and medical psychologists can offer support and guidance so that people with type 1 diabetes can self-manage their disease at home. We can provide preventive treatment to reduce the risk of complications. We can give positive feedback and participate in person-centered care. But do we offer a real solution in clinical practice? If we ask our patients, their answer would be no, because a real solution to someone with type 1 diabetes means no more diabetes. What would a real solution look like? Well, the basic problem in type 1 diabetes is that the insulin producing cells are destroyed. So new cells that completely take over glucose control are needed. Let's imagine someone with type 1 diabetes. Let's call her Jane. Jane is 35 years old and has taken insulin most of her life. One day Jane hears about a new treatment for diabetes on the news and attends her doctor's office to find out what the possibilities are for her. Jane's doctor writes out a prescription for 1 million islets and makes an appointment at her hospital so that the islets can be infused into her body. Insulin injections can be stopped and her glucose measurement device can be removed. Her brain can relax as she does not have to worry anymore about all the daily efforts of self-management, about losing consciousness due to low glucose levels or about long-term complications. Is this cell replacement utopia or is it clinical reality? On a small scale, this is what we already do. It is called islet transplantation. In a special laboratory, we can isolate the islets of Langerhans from the pancreas of deceased organ donors. These donor islets we can infuse into the liver of a person with type 1 diabetes, so the liver providing a new home from which the insulin producing cells can function. Every year at the Leiden University Medical Center and at a limited number of centers around the world, islet transplantations are carried out in a small number of people with complicated type 1 diabetes. Fantastic, isn't it? So why do doctors not write out more prescriptions for these donor islets? Well, several reasons. First, availability. There is a shortage of deceased organ donors. Tens of thousands of organ donors will never be enough for the millions of people with type 1 diabetes. Second, rejection. Your immune system will fiercely defend your body against cells that are not your own. So your immune system needs to be suppressed with medication leading to an increased risk of infections and other illnesses. But islet transplantation in type 1 diabetes works. However, only few patients are eligible. So how do we go from clinical reality for some to clinical reality for many? The answer is stem cells. Human pluripotent stem cells to be precise. These types of cells have the capacity to turn into every cell of your body. In 1998, it was shown that special human stem cells could be cultured and expanded indefinitely, creating an unlimited source of these cells. After many years, scientists were finally able to generate insulin producing cells from these stem cells by mimicking development of a pancreas in a tissue culture dish. This process takes about 30 days in laboratories. 30 days to turn naive pluripotent stem cells into clusters of cells that can lower glucose. Novel stem cell islet archipelagos that stretch beyond the reach of the eye. But can they also be used for treating people with type 1 diabetes? In 2021, the first scientific report showed that these cells can survive and secrete insulin for more than a year after transplantation in people with type 1 diabetes. And other data indicate 
that stem cell islets can lower glucose, even to the extent that insulin is not necessary anymore. Does this mean we can repeat the headlines of 1922? Are we on track of a diabetes cure this time around, not for a few, but potentially for all people with type 1 diabetes? In my view, yes, we are on track. But we are not there yet. The current stem cell islets are not recognized by our own immune system. So those drugs that suppress the immune system are still necessary. Scientists are working on this problem. We have tools to make changes in these cells so that they may not be destroyed by the immune system. We may hide the cells in biomaterial scaffolds, kind of like Harry Potter wrapping himself in a cloak of invisibility. Or we can turn a patient's own cells into pluripotent stem cells and generate one's own stem cell islets. Whatever the nature of these future developments, a key goal is limiting complications of the transplantation procedure and preventing the formation of tumor cells. In these early stages of a new therapy, we may not know all the risk. So continuous risk-benefit analysis of this novel treatment is essential. I am convinced that scientists in academia and industry are going to solve most of these issues. But it is going to take time. We are in the middle of an exciting journey in the field of islet replacement therapy for type 1 diabetes. I fully empathize with my patients who tell me that this novel treatment journey is so slow. But although it may feel slow, when I look back, enormous strides have been made over the past few years. So I am really hopeful there will be a day when Jane, our 35-year-old female with type 1 diabetes, is called by her doctor to let her know that her stem cell islets are ready for transplantation. Whatever the challenges ahead, scientists and healthcare providers are truly moving towards a real solution. And one day, people like Jane will be able to live a normal life without type 1 diabetes. Imagine how sweet that will be.